So hello everyone, my name is Eric Garcia. I am the host of Denver Droids and we're gonna, if you're interested in um, mobile development or just getting started in software development, we have tons of courses and content that will be uh, very useful for your early career. Uh, tonight, we have a presentation by Luis uh, Gutierrez uh, of related to microservices and how to design and deploy microservices. Before we get to the actual content, I would like to do a quick uh, exercise to get to know who's joining tonight. So please, uh, everyone, when I say your name, uh, please give a, a brief uh, introduction on um, who you are, what do you do, and what uh, interest, what are your uh, interests of um, as of lately? Could be mobile, could be um, software. Any trending topic that you have been eager to hear more about? So let's start it with Nathan. Hey, I'm uh, Nathan Retto. I'm a principal engineer, Android engineer at Alfie. It's a um, tablet company. Um, lately, I've been really interested in Golang for some back end stuff. And that's what I've been doing a bit in my spare time. And that's it. Great. Thank you, Nathan. Next on the list, we have Sharon. Hi guys. Um, I am or have been a Java developer for the last decade, at least um, doing API development. So I know a lot about the, uh, um, the microservices part. I've just now started doing a Google Nano degree on Android development with Kotlin. So I'm, I'm trying to tie my old knowledge with my new knowledge. That's me. That's great. The mobile space is very interesting since there's too many constraints on those poor devices. It could be the battery, it could be the processor, it could be the RAM, <laughs> even the network. So it's a very interesting space. Um, let's go ahead with, um, we have a guest whose name appears just as uh, the letter P. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. I just created a new account in Meetup. I am Android developer and I just moved to Vancouver. So I'm looking for some Android group in Meetup to join. So I saw uh, this group and um, I'm excited to join to uh, see what you guys introduce um, here. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining. Uh, we're always we're always happy to see international guests. And um, yes, we're, we're actually gonna have between the end of the year and early next year, really good workshops on Android development as well. Awesome, yeah. I'm excited to join, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, next on the list we have Roger. All right. All right, it looks like Roger is not available. Well, um, I'll go ahead and so <clears throat> I'll do the exercise myself as well. Um, I am an Android lead engineer. I currently work in the medical space with uh, Kaiser Permanente. And I have been doing this for about seven years now, seven, eight years now. And Honestly, it has, the mobile space has been growing like crazy. So anyone interested in getting started in the mobile space is gonna have a pleasant experience, I believe. Also, uh, but it does come with a few challenges, uh, especially since you have constrained resources, you have to make very optimized um, software. 
And also you have a, a, another challenge that uh, you might have users that are visually impaired or that are, are constrained in some other way. So you also have to tailor your apps uh, to embrace the ADA experience. More than that, um, let's go ahead and uh, Luis, uh, which is our presenter today, can you please uh, introduce yourself? Sure. Well, um, hello everyone. My name is Luis Gutierrez. Um, I'm currently a software engineer at Microsoft. I've uh, worked in several other locations uh, throughout my working career, but um, I I will be coming back to my uh, to my full presentation in just a moment. So. Um, First of all, welcome everyone to Microservices 102. So um, if you happen to join us on the previous session on Microservices 101, there uh, we cover some of the uh, fundamental details and considerations we want to have when working and or designing microservices. And on this part, on, on this workshop, uh, we will be looking into, um, a, first of all, a quick review of what we saw last time. And then uh, we will uh, go back and revisit some of the, uh, of the design considerations we looked at last, uh, last time. And afterwards, we're getting to the good stuff. We're getting to, um, how, how, to how to set up our projects, how to... Um, set up our tooling, um, how to properly deploy our services and how and uh, how how to monitor them, uh, keep them in check. And well we'll provide some additional topics for for you to go ahead and research once we're done with this. Now on, unlike the uh, the previous the previous workshop, which was mostly theoretical, in for this one, I'd like to do it with a little twist. So, um, as we walk through each of the points, I will also be uh, jumping into uh, showcasing them in action through a case study. So, now, um Back to me. Um, I've been a software engineer for about eight years. I've also been a. Well, I also am a certified Scrum master. I currently work at Microsoft, but I also work for GE, Oracle, and I have my own run-ins with the business world by uh, a couple of tech-related business ventures in the past. So um, I I. Throughout my career, I've been able to uh, look into um, the full spectrum of the development life cycle from inception to delivery and maintenance. And I came out the other side with a couple of insights and I hope to be able to share this with you and for you to boost your careers or gain additional uh, insights or ideas for you to leverage. So, okay. If you uh, have any questions at any moment, or um, if you just want to add something or whatever, feel free to uh, raise your hand or just interrupt that in, at, at any point. Okay, so let's get started. So on our last session, we, we discussed what was a microservice and um, what were the con the pros, the cons about uh, microservices? And one of the most important points, why isn't it a good match for everything? What, um, so a microservice, a microservice architecture is a collection of, of small decoupled services which communicate together in some meaningful way to provide services to an, ex to an external client or clients. This can be done through, for example, mobile applications, web applications, um, hybrid applications or APIs, pretty much any mechanism that allows 
other parties to interact with the service that, that can be modeled. Microservices follow a, a very specific par paradigm in which each service is intended to be very specific, which uh, for, for the purposes of microservices, this means that it performs a very distinct set of responsibilities, which are different from all the other uh, services in the, in the ecosystem. They are also self-contained. So um, all of the uh, behaviors related to a certain area stick together into their own service. They are not like scattered across the, uh, the entire service mesh. And they are also loosely coupled, which means they can be replaced and or upgraded independently so long as the um, as internal contracts remain in place. We will get to that uh, later as we, as we progress to, uh, through this introduction. So one of the main points we discussed in the, uh, on the previous session was that microservices is not, a, it's not a golden hammer. So we cannot use it for every single type of application. It mostly fits applications with one or two characteristics. The first one is that um, if the application has specific needs for, and just for Kaker, some scalability or availability or performance or that, or that kind of stuff, then that will be a pretty good fit for microservices. Another choice would be to have um, something like a cloud-based, a cloud-native application or an application with several different moving parts, which can be controlled in a sort of centralized fashion. So this doesn't mean that we can't use microservices for, I don't, I don't know, uh, a sample app or whatever. It just means that it won't be that nice of a fit. Why? Because although microservices do offer the, uh, the power and abilities to, cre to create a very flexible, scalable, and resilient infrastructure, they also have a set of problems arising from their distributed nature. And well, the, with this, I mean that at the end of the day, microservices is a variant of, a, of distributed systems. So when we deal with, uh, with distributed systems, we tend to run into problems such as um, resource allocation or um, increased complexity or higher throughput or higher resource usage, security concerns, that kind of stuff which need to be addressed from the, from the get-go. So um, in this case, we can say that microservices is not an end to itself. It's more, of, uh, it's more like a tool for your application's goals. It's more of a journey than an actual destination. So, Up to, up to now, does anyone has, have any questions about um, anything of what we just discussed? Okay, cool. So uh, let's get moving. Now, um, as we mentioned, microservices require a set of um, design considerations that we need to tackle from the get-go. Most, most of the times, um, microservices emerge from actual need. For example, we have a large legacy application of some sort, and because of just sheer size or new incoming requirements or whatever, we are forced 
to um to transform it from being like the massive monolith to a couple of uh, a couple of services and those services later on dissolving to little microservices interacting together that's like the common pathway to microservices it is not the only way for example we could like uh, start it from the from the very beginning as microservices but the the usual way is to have something already there which due to some requirement changes or some um or some obstacles along the way, need, uh, that thing needs to evolve and it needs to become a, a microservice oriented uh, application. When that happens, there are a couple of things we need to take care of. Now, um, this is by no means uh, an exhaustive list. There may be more depending on your use case. So, um, but we will cover like the bare essential, the, mo the most common items. So first off, when we say uh, microservices is actual, is a distributed system, we do not mean it lightly. It is actually composed of different little services which interact with each other by means of uh, of standard messaging. For example, um, we can have a service A, which requires some information from another service to perform some action, or we could have like a composite of actions, a pipeline or something, which we, which we need to trigger in a specific way. So for these kinds of situations, we both need to have a clear way for each of our services to talk to each other. And we need to have some sort of structure in which the services will talk to each other. So the way in which a, uh, a microservice mesh uh, talks, well, gossips within, uh, within itself, is by use of immutable shared models. These shared models represent an interface, a sort of contract between each service, which determines the way each service can refer to other services and the kind of information they can expect from each of those, uh, each of those messages. This means, for example, we, we can have um, me messages intended for um, placing orders or messages intended for um, creating users or whatnot. The, the main thing that separates um, sh the shared models from any other internal model for the microservice is that is, well, three things the first one is well it is shared so potentially every single service you have in your service mesh which is the collection of your microservices each service has the potential to actually use this model as its um public slash internal api so they are able to understand the payload of the message and use it in some meaningful way the second one, these models are implemented using a, a technologically and language agnostic way. For example, we can uh, represent each model as a JSON document, or we can represent it as an XML document, or maybe particle buffers and you're into that kind of stuff. So we have choices. But one of the main uh, one of the main constraints about shared models is that they should be able to be represented in a way in which the underlying implementation of the service doesn't matter. So um, unless you're like structuring everything with Java and uh, and for example using a prepackaged uh, jar files to contain your interfaces. If, if you're working that way, you can actually use those uh, shared jars as your, uh, as your interfaces, but this isn't usually the case. 
most microservices are built as a collection of tools. For example, we could have some services implemented in Java, while we have other ones implemented in um, C or C++ for, for performance. We could have some of them implemented in Python. We could have um, the Audible implemented in, um, I don't know, Haskell or whatever. So we can have this, this uh, different set of services implemented in different and completely different tools. It's, um, we have this flexibility. And well, that gives us a couple of advantages, inclu including the, uh, the fact that we can choose the best tool for the job, but it also comes with the, the, the main complication that we can no longer just, uh, for example, pass around a jar file containing interfaces or whatever. We now need to have something that all languages can understand. And these are the uh, technology agnostic and language agnostic models. The third, the third uh, characteristic of the shared models is that they are immutable. Immutable means that once rolled out, they are not allowed to change. You can add stuff to it, but you can neither update it nor remove it. There are strategies to deal with these uh, kind of constraints, but for the most part, the models are created once and left alone. These, uh, these um, somewhat restricted definition actually gives us a lot of flexibility because it allows us to scale to humongous sizes without lose without losing the uh, the ability for our service to um, continue operating or adding every or adding additional stuff and keep uh, keeping the general stability of the entire service mesh and through the correct application of, uh, of version techniques, which we will review later on, we can actually um, compensate for, for the immutable behavior of the shared models. Now, um, back to, um, to our original topic on communication, we just discussed on what are the messages we can send, but so far we haven't spoken about how can we send those messages between the services. And for this, we basically have one of two choices and how to determine which of the choices to pick depends a lot on our requirements and um, the way our information system is uh, laid out, but they revolve around one of one or two options. We can either have them be a synchronous imperative style of, uh, of communication in which um, we send a message to service B, then we wait for it to reply. Then we send another message to service C and we wait for it to reply and so on. It is a synchronous message pass passing. And if you've worked at any point in your careers with um, AJAX or um, HTTP requests, this should be pretty familiar because that's the way HTTP is meant to work. It is a, it is a request response cycle which fits pretty well to the uh, synchronous paradigm. So on one hand, we have the synchronous approach to things, which uh, for the purposes of microservices will be referred to as orchestration. And on the other, on the other hand, we have asynchronous communication which for microservices is, uh, we will refer to it as choreographies. Now, when we're dealing with asynchronous message, message passing, we are no longer expecting to get a response for every single message we send. It's more of a fire and forget uh, kind of approach. So 
in an asynchronous uh, in an asynchronous message passing system, we will have some entity in the middle, for example, um, an event boss of some kind, or maybe a message broker, and AMQP server or something like that, sitting in the middle, which will handle retrieve, uh, getting the messages and delivering them to whoever is out there hearing for such messages. It becomes more declarative, more reactive. So instead of thinking about, um, about message passing as a request response cycle, we can think of it as events. So um, doing so, putting it on a on a more specific uh, example. If we have a service which is for a, which is um, updating user information for some purpose, maybe um maybe the user went ahead and changed uh, some privacy options or whatever, and we want to propagate these to other places. Instead of sending one message to each of the places we need to update, we will create an event. In this case, we can call it like um, privacy options updated event or something like that. And we will send this message to a message broker or any or a message hub. The message hub in turn will remit this event to any other service which is listening for that kind of event. Then they will receive the event with all the uh, information required for them to know what kind of change took place, and then they can make um, any adjustments deemed necessary on their end. If they do need to propagate additionally uh, additional uh, information or something because some other option was restricted or something which they are not handling, for example, um, let's say um, one of the changes the user did was uh, disabling recommendations. So um, we will be sending information to the. Uh, to the recommendation service and that that recommendation service might also need to inform another service that it will no longer be computing uh, recommendations so um we start getting these e cascade of events happening between each service which um, happens at its own time so um by the time the um the uh the recommendation service has finished uh, processing whatever it's need to uh, process and and persisted those changes. The uh, the event that started the entire chain may well the service that started the entire chain may already be um, idle, waiting for another incoming request or whatever. So um, we are no longer enforcing a certain order or a certain timeliness to events. We just want to express that an event happened and, so, and have other services react to this event taking place. Up to now, do we have any questions? So you were mentioning that the models should not change uh, later in the presentation, will you address how, how, in case there's a need for changing the model, how does that look like? Yeah, actually, that one that is performed through something we call versioning. It's not like um, having uh, version 1.01, version 1.1, or something. It's more of an approach on how to um, phase out stuff. I will go into more detail um, once we get there, but um, the, the thing you should know by now is that even though you're not supposed to modify the, the models once they are published, there is certainly a way to make those kind of changes without compromising this initial rule. Did, uh, does this answer your question? It does, thank you. Awesome. So um, 
anybody else has any questions? Cool, so uh, let's continue. Now, um, when we're speaking of microservices, we um, usually end up with a, with a kind of interesting situation we do not normally face when dealing with a monolithic service or such. Microservices involve communication, a lot of communication. And um, since we can no longer count on the services being located on the same machine or whatever, we are actually forced to do most of the communication through the network. If you, if you are starting to connect the dots in that one, then I, I believe you can see what the, what the issue is at this point. If not, when, well, let me elaborate further. So if, uh, if, uh, if the user wants to achieve something through a, uh, through a microservice based application, it will generally not only uh, impact, uh, not only request the, the work of one service, it will generally impact several different services. The more granular your service mesh is, the more services you're likely to hit. And well, hitting these many services will actually cause some sort of a cascade reaction in which they will start calling additional services and those services might also call other services and, and you get the idea. All of them need to communicate through the network and making network communication actually consume some of our bandwidth. So um, one, of the one of the resources that ends up uh, becoming the most scarce you know, when dealing with microservices is actually our network bandwidth. Because, and if you ever work with, uh, in a company or something that uses microservices, you can actually, um, see that microservices tend to be pretty chatty. So um, they, they will start sending messages by, uh, by the ton at any given time. It might take even a millisecond for a hundred or plus messages to be sent across the network. And that does actually kind of impact the overall responsiveness of the, uh, of the entire system because, well, networking isn't the fastest way to access information. So in order for us to tackle this, there are several different strategies we can use to reduce our, band, our uh, network usage and optimize our access to information. One of the uh, most basic strategies we can use is caching. When we cache something, we grab a copy of it, store it, and if we uh, later have the need to, re to use that specific information, we just retrieve it from the cache. We no longer need to do a, a network call or something like that to obtain that information. It's already there. So it is actually faster to use caches than to um, make requests over the network every time we need something. But adding caches is not, uh, it's not a silver bullet. It, also, it has an additional problem that we also need to consider. Information can become dated. This means that the more time it passes uh, between when the information was first cached to the time we're to the moment in which we are accessing that information, that information may no longer be valid. This isn't a problem with information that uh, tends to change slowly or that doesn't really change at all. For example, on um, user settings or, or similar, users tend to configure everything one time 
And afterwards, they just let it be. They pretty much never reach to the settings page again unless something major happens. So that information, we can assume it will have a longer lifetime. But um, if we went for something else, like um, let's say pricing for pricing information or um, inventory stock or um, or similar information, which actually tends to have a lot of movement, a lot of change um, added to it then we can no longer assume that the same information will be valid after a week, not even an hour or a, or a couple minutes. It may be stale almost instantly. So our data and its update patterns determine how long can we cache it. Um, it determines how long we can cache that information knowing that it may still be valid. So um, this is actually known as data lifetime. So um, when we're talking about data lifetime, we need to consider that if information can suddenly become stale and or obsolete, we do need to have a strategy in place to up to refresh the inf this information. Otherwise, we run the risk of providing incorrect, uh, in of running with, in with incorrect information. So when we design our microservices and implement caching strategies, we now need to take into consideration the fact that this information has a certain lifetime associated with it and that once we are getting too close to its expiration date, or if we pass this expiration date, we will need to refresh it. Refreshing it, well, it's a, it's a pretty straightforward uh, process. We re remove that entry from our cache and we request it again from the original source maybe another service, maybe a third party application or whatever. And now, and this I actually highlight here as a pro tip, we cannot assume that every time we want to refresh information, it will be there for us. Life happens, stuff goes down and networks are never reliable. So, if something can fail, it will eventually do. So it may so happen that you might not be able to refresh that information. And then you have a choice. You can run with the risk of using, a, uh, of using potentially stale or obsolete information, but keep providing your services, which is, um, remaining available for the users or if your situation demands it you can choose to either have the most up-to-date information or none at all and this is known as consistency if you if availability and consistency mean anything to you these relate to the gap principle is anyone familiar with um, the CAP principle or CAP theorem? Anyone? Can you please repeat the question? Um, do you know what CAP theorem stands for? From the last session, I do remember. Let's see if we have somebody that has, that remembers as well. Does anyone else remember? Maybe not, but um, if I recall correctly, it was related to, you, can, you have to decide between your service being um, highly available or consistent, right? 
that that uh, there is a trade-off you have to make. Yeah, GAP is an acronym. It stands for consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. The GAP theorem is uh, a simple proposition, and it states: in the event of a partition, you must either choose either remaining available or being consistent. You cannot have both, so you need to choose. For most applications, remaining available is the go-to choice. It's the easiest one, it's the most simple one, and in general, it works. But in some cases, like in the case study we will be looking at later on uh, in the session, this is not an option, so we need to be consistent. In the event of a failure, we can no longer operate. Okay, so far, any questions? Awesome, so let's continue. client interaction. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if we have a beautiful uh, service mesh or something, if our clients aren't able to interact with it. If you've ever been in a situation in which you um, try to talk to someone while everybody else is talking over you or whatever, you'll get the feel, you'll know the feeling. You cannot listen to uh, to a lot of people at a time. You can at most hear one, either two or something like that, but not a hundred or more. So the same thing happens to our clients. If we expose, for example, our mobile application or whatever to the honest, honest madness going on at the service mesh level, it will be unmaintainable at best. So we need to provide some sort of layer for the clients to interact with that abstracts away the complexity of our service mesh while still allowing the, the client to access the, uh, the service mesh. This is generally, re generally referred to as a gateway. Now, we could just add some sort of a reverse proxy or load balancer or whatever and call it a day, and it might work for your situation. But in general, just having something in there isn't always the best option. And this is one of the uh, key takeaways from this section. The more capable your client is, the more features it can use and the more features it will require from your service. This means it's not the same, uh, it's never the same having a mobile application than a, than a desktop application or a web application. They will have different capabilities, they will have different um, means to access information, and they will have different um, specs uh, with, with which they can handle the information. As um, Eric mentioned at the beginning of the session, for example, mobile, mobile devices are actually fairly limited in terms of specifications little RAM, uh, uh, capable but not so powerful processor, limited battery life, that kind of stuff. While a regular PC has, uh, has RAM to spare, ha can have a very mighty processor, it can even have a, a monstrous GPU just for the kicks. So they are not Although they both are clients to you and your application, they technically are not the same. They will expect 
different capability. Uh, they will expect the service to offer different capabilities for them based on what they can on the capabilities they themselves have. So we have two ways to go about this. The first one is um, to just say, okay, I get it, but honestly, it's complicated. And um, the company I work for actually only, only allows me to have a single gateway. So um, I will just have a single gateway for everything and let them, and let them eat cake pretty much. So, um, if that were to happen, we will run into this scenario, the, the plain old gateway server. We will have some, we will have some server which um, given a request from the client, it will convert it in some meaningful way to, um, to payloads different services in the service mesh might react to. It will send the messages back to those clients. It will await responses. And once everything is, uh, um, is settled down, it will reply back to our client. So that's one way to do it. It's pretty valid. And for starters, it is actually a pretty good choice. But later down the line, we might decide that we want to expose additional uh, more computationally intensive operations to uh, to our PC clients or we want to provide certain stuff only for the mobile but not for the uh, PC and, and so on. And our gateway starts to get a little bit complicated. One way to manage that, that um, increasing complexity is by using what is referred to as backends for frontends. This means having a special gateway server for a special category of clients. So um, we could have a, a gateway specific for um, any kind of PC-like client. We could have a gateway for iOS. We could have a gateway for Android. We could have a, a gateway serving as our public API. We could have... A, a uh, separate gateway serving IoT devices and so on. So that way we can keep um, the capabilities each client expects from your service isolated from the capabilities that other, uh, other different kinds of clients expect from your service. This, although it seems more complicated, it actually allows you to better distribute the resources available for your, uh, for your entire service mesh because you won't be demanding as much on every single request. Instead of having just um, the, average, uh, the average resource utilization we face with having a single gateway, we can have a more tailored response depending on the bulk of our client. If our application is mainly used by mobile applications, but we do also offer um, like a web browser experience or something, maybe our resource utilization may be lower because the mobile app isn't able to show every single, um, every single capability our service offers. So um, it can act, um, having frontends for back, backends for frontends in line with proper monitoring can actually help us implement better strategies to better and more and more efficiently manage our systems resources. Up to this point, does anyone have any questions or anything they, they might like to add or something? Oh, cool. Now, versioning. And this one goes back to the, uh, the immutable model we mentioned. And I believe, Eric, this will get to give you additional information on, on your question. 
So in microservices, we, uh, we do have this notion of immutable shared models, which as I mentioned before, are meant to be the common interface shared by all services with which we uh, with which they can communicate to, uh, between each other in a way that is guaranteed to be understood by every single service. Since the definitions are shared um, to all services, all services can potentially understand it. And in order for us to ma to um, to manage it, we usually prefer for these models to be immutable. So immutable in this sense means we cannot modify it. And that actually brings uh, several advantages because if you ever had to deal with um, something mutating, um, which is actually shared by lots of different locations, for example, um, and this is typical in, in code, especially old code, something like um, that, that static variable or that uh, public static class, which nobody uses, uh, which nobody really instantiates or anything, but has all these um, public uh, static methods and fields and whatnot, which are meant to be used by everyone. If you've ever seen something like that and you've had the uh, bad luck to deal with an issue caused by it, you might understand the problems arising from having mutable global state. So the problem with having mutable global state is that, well, it's mutable. Everyone can change it. If everyone can change it, it becomes difficult to track what happened and who is to blame in this case. And the, our shared models are no different. If we allowed our models to be modified at will, we would cause uh, we will end up in situations in which, for example, um, one service might understand some part of the payload of a model, but the other one will not be able to because the model has changed and they are no longer able to understand it. And well, this is a this is pretty much a fact of life. If we change something, we are bound to break something else. So um, in order for us to prevent it, we use, uh, we try to make it as non-changing as possible. Hence, we use immutable models. As long as these interfaces or these shared models are consistent and stable, you can add as many services you want to your service mesh and everything will work like clockwork. But the moment you need to change anything, we will start running into issues because, because since we cannot just go ahead and change the model because something else might break, we need to get clever about how we make the change. Now, to make the change is actually pretty simple. If we cannot modify it, we can just copy it over, make our changes to the copy and publish the copy. Once the copy is live, we can just progressively change our, our other services to use this, this new definition. So that is the basics of how to deal with immutable models. Since we cannot modify them or remove them, we can just copy them and phase them out, stop using them. There are two strategies to actually 
perform this copy and phase out uh, this copy and phase out work I'm referring to, and they are referred to as migration strategies. So we there are like two big, uh, two large categories of uh, migration strategies. The first one is a progressive migration strategy in which we create, uh, well, we grab the model we want to modify, we make a copy, we change whatever we want, we publish that. Then immediately after publishing it, we deprecate the original model. So we start sending a notice to everyone that, okay, this model is going down. This is the replacement. This new model is the replacement. Use it instead. After a certain period, we will remove this, uh, this original model, and this one will be the only model in existence. And then after a while, you take down the old model and move uh, and start using the, the the updated model as um, the one and only version of that of that particular message. Pros of this approach: it's easy. You can just send. Uh, you can just add the deprecation notices. Send uh, whatever amount of emails you need to send to alert every user of your of of the model that okay, the model is changing and whatnot. And after a while, you just remove the reference and assume everyone else will be doing their part and updating their models and so on. Cons, and this applies especially to, um, to when we are, um, to, when, to, the, to those models as used near the gateways. If we do change those models, we run into the situation in which our, uh, one of our peer services or peer users is not making the change for any reason. It may be that um, the, new, the new model doesn't really suit them or whatever. And if you just deprecate it and afterwards remove it, those services that didn't make the change Will be will be broken. They can no longer communicate with new uh, with the other services because they are now using an incompatible message. So in order for in order for us to um, treat this, we have an alternate strategy, which is a concurrent migration strategy. For this strategy. Same as before, we grab the old model, we copy it, we make our changes. But unlike the, the, uh, the progressive strategy, we keep both of them. Uh, uh, simul uh, we keep them simultaneously under different alias, under different names or whatever, but we keep them both. So under this strategy, every Every service that requires the uh, uh, the new functionality offered by the new message will adopt the message. But every service that doesn't require that one or which rely heavily on the original message can still have the message. For us, it is absolutely backwards compatible. So um, there is... Uh, that uh, your applications clients or your other services are no longer forced to make a change if they don't really need to make a change. And that makes their lives somewhat easier. The con is, and this happens with everything that needs to be backwards compatible, we start accumulating legacy code on our code base. So then migra migrating um, shared models becomes a, becomes a choice between um, keeping our code base lean at the expense of other services or keeping those services running reliably at the expense of our code base. It sounds like a fatalistic or something, but it, 
Um, but for certain scenarios, one kind of approach is better than for other kinds of scenarios. So it depends on what you're changing and what implications it may have down the line. So making the changes requires you to think a little bit more into the future to try to predict the uh, the changes it may have on your on the message consumers and reacting appropriately. Now, now that we're here on the uh, on the version tab, just a little note about versions. Although the term versioning makes may sound related to stuff like um, semantic versioning or something, or having like version 1.0 of the API or whatever, they cannot be further, uh, they, they cannot be more unrelated. One thing is how you, how you manage the, uh, the evolving state of your service and or application, which is versioning. And another one is tagging something with a version number. And although it may sound like a great idea, Versioning clients or versioning, well, versioning the API or gateways your clients are using is, is generally a very bad idea. It's often a very big maintenance nightmare because not only do you have the, uh, the burdens of backwards compatibility, you also have the burdens of um, of your clients simply refusing to update at all as, you, as whatever you publish on your APIs, if you're a good citizen of the internet and whatnot, you should keep life. A couple of days ago in a, in a call I was in um, with these, uh, I believe he was a vice president or something, um, he mentioned something that I believe is quite truthful on itself. He said, once published, APIs are forever. So unlike certain, um, certain other projects or companies, which I will not be mentioning in this case, if you ever seen one, you'll know it. Um, but unlike those kind of projects, which feel they can just go ahead and run and run amok on their APIs and remove whatever they want whenever they want, generally your clients are relying on your API to uh, on your API stability. If if you just go ahead and change it uh, because of a whim or an, or whatever, you run you you are not only excluding those clients, but actually causing, uh, causing problems for all, your, all the ecosystem that uh, arises around your API. So once released into the, into the realms of internet, an API is no longer about your service. It's your service plus the ecosystem that exists around it. So, just going ahead and changing things because you feel like it, it is actually quite um, damaging for this ecosystem. And in general, if you are like a decent person or whatever, you will not be making this kind of, uh, of, of impositions on your, on your potential clients or third parties especially if your API is large enough to be called a third-party app. So, any questions so far? No, no questions so far. Cool. Okay, let's move on. So, that was designing. Now let's get to the fun part. And here I am actually gonna share this uh, case study with you all, so you can actually follow it as we move along. Um, you can find it on the Zoom chat. Now, 
This section I titled From Scratchpad to Production. We already went over the mo over the most common areas one needs to um, keep an eye on when designing a microservice-based system. But if we were only asked to design something without implementing it, well, we will be done by this point. But generally, we want something to be functional. So we need to get hands on. Now, every modern software project should start from a repository. If you're a good coder, you will start with a repository. You will be using version control over your changes. Yeah. And well, a microservices project is not really different from any other project in that regard. The main only difference we have here is that we now have several different aspects of our application which behave like standalone units. So the, the way we structure our repository in this case, if you start thinking about it, it might not seem like super relevant. For example, you might, you might go ahead and say, okay, well, I, I can just uh, use Git for, for my project, keep my keep all my repository somewhere, and uh, I can call it a day, right? Well, technically, yes, but the more your service starts to grow, and the more it, um, and the more services start uh, springing into life, which, believe me, is a thing, you might soon find that your original design for your um, for your repository is no longer a good fit. For example, um, and this one, I am not gonna specify where I saw it, but um, this is one of those, please don't do it kind of scenarios. In one of the places I worked in, they actually considered it a pretty good idea to keep everything on a single repository and well, it worked well when they had like four or five services, perhaps when they had 10 or 20. But right now the project has almost 50 different services. And um, the main problem with it is not that it has a um, uh, bazillion services by this point. The problem is the repository itself weighs enough to consume the entire hard drive of any mod, of any uh, of any standard uh, laptop unit. So um, if your hard drive is like uh, one uh, one twenty gig gigs uh, of space, you will be uh, it will be consuming about eighty gigs just for kicks, and that and that is. Uh, a fresh install. The more you use it, the more artifacts it generates and the more space it consumes. The more stuff you have and the more changes going on in the repository, especially if it's an active one, it is actually surprising the speed at which your entire hard drive can be filled up by just a single repository um, when dealing with um, microservice-based architecture. So um, this is by no means a discouragement. It might be the correct way to go about your own specific project, but at scale, my own personal observations on it are that it is really not worth it unless you're willing to give every single contributor a uh, a large PC with a one terabyte and hard drive or something, which I guess most companies will not. So um, back to the topic. Um, when we're dealing with, uh, well, the repository structure we choose 
dictates how uh, how our not only how we will be storing the code for our microservices, but it will also dictate how can we build them, test them, and deploy them. It also dictates how easy it is for contributors to participate in the development. And contributors can be anything ranging from uh, random people on the internet to employees at a company or whatever. So we basically have three ways about going, uh, three, three ways to set up our repository. I will not favor one or another, or at least I will try not to. I, I just want you to know the, uh, the options available to you should you start uh, developing a, mic a microservice application. Option number one, create a single repository, store everything in it, no particular structure and call it a day. Just um, set up, for example, your Gradle files to build different artifacts for each of your services or whatever. And you can have a relatively flat structure. This works wonders if we're talking about uh, monolithic applications or in the in the in the transition phase between monoliths and microservices, when we still have like this one big chunk of your application plus um, one or two or something like that little services orbiting the. Uh, orbiting the block. So um, for that kind of scenarios, it actually makes a lot of sense just to keep us in repository. Why? Because the more repositories you have, the more configurations you need to attend to, and the more complexity it brings into the table. There are ways to manage the complexity, but it's, it is now something that you need to take care of. So single repo, create, a, create one repo, toss everything into it, no particular order, no particular structure, and call it a day. We can call it also your, like the standard uh, college project or whatever. Mono repo. A mono repo at first glance may look indistinguishable from a single, repo, uh, single repository project with one main difference. A monorepo actually imposes some sort of structure to the way the single repository is laid out. If you've ever worked in, uh, in front-end development, in UX development, you might be familiar with tools like um, Jarn Workspaces or Lerna or something like that. Those kind of tools which allow you to um, define the core of your package at the top level and then have little uh, directories with sub packages, each sharing some sort of configuration. That is uh, the standard mono repo layout. In a, mon in a mono repo, we will have like a central tool or some other system which coordinates all the builds, all the tests, and all the deployments from the top level. Afterwards, we might have um, one or many different uh, subdirectories which will behave as our packages. Each package will contain the code of one of our services. That way we can keep everything in a single location and, um, and have everything version controlled. It is easier. It is not as simple to set, to set up as a single repository. It does require you to look into, um, into management tools. It does require you to set up some of this stuff, write, write some code lines and whatnot. But it is generally simpler than the last approach we will be looking at. Cons, if it grows and it will grow, it can actually become too massive for its own sake. 
And we will end up with situations like um, what I mentioned before starting with this uh, explanation. We can have gigantic um, gigabyte measured repositories containing lots and lots of stuff, which uh, in turn, because of all the dependencies uh, in place along the repository, which is actually kind of a thing, having code uh, nearby gives the devs some sort of a creative licensing, like grabbing stuff from another package they shouldn't really be getting and that kind of stuff because, well, at the end of the day, it's the file structure, it works everywhere, who cares? So builds, tests, and deployments can actually get pretty messy and they might actually end up taking way too long. Why? Because all the dependency chains at the end of the day, they incur into time costs. So we need to offer, in order for us to build C, we need to first build B and in order for, uh, in order for us to build B, we need to build A and B and so on. So it might look like a good idea, but if you're actually going serious with it, you might consider this a uh, transition between having just a repository and the last model, which is multi-repo. In multi-repo, well, we have one repository per service, or in if we want to be like uh, using a hybrid system of sorts, we can have several repositories containing several different services, which are somehow interrelated to each other. Pros of the uh, multi-repo approach, it is extremely highly scalable. It is very resource efficient. It is very easy for contributors to participate in whatever section they are tasked to. Um, if, for example, they need to work in the uh, in the order service, they can just download the order repository, work, submit their changes, and don't even concern themselves about the existence of the other nine, 99 services you might have. Cons, configuration, deployment, build, and testing com uh, complexity. Since we now have isolated entities, we need to provide a mechanism for us to bring them together in order for us to build along with depend, uh, build along with their dependencies if needed, um, test them in unison and deploy them as a single unit. So we actually, uh, if we are using a multi-repo approach, using uh, build tools and uh, using some sort of uh, CI system is a must. You can you can no longer just uh, hack your way through it with uh, bash commands. You need something automatic to manage all the chaos. Okay. Now let's move onwards. And speaking of uh, continuous integration, I added this, uh, this slide assuming that uh, someone in the audience is not really familiar with uh, continuous integration, but um, if, and if you haven't really uh, looked into um, or works with uh, continuous integration servers or something, please uh, please let me know. Otherwise, I will uh, I will briefly discuss the section and move on to to spare some time. So, um, is anyone here on the call unfamiliar with continuous integration or continuous integration solutions? Yeah, a couple. Um, 
I have worked with uh, Jenkins in the past. Although of my, with my employer, we ended up like developing our own solution. Yep. <coughs> anyone else is, um, well, is anyone else like um, familiar or unfamiliar with uh, continuous integration? On a mobile, we often use Bitrise, and I've seen our backend teams using Jenkins. Cool. Okay, so um, I figured that since we don't really have like uh, anyone stating that they are not familiar with, I'll just uh, walk quickly over it. So uh, continuous integration are um, automatic automatic tools which allows us to basically automate the uh, the process of bringing together our code changes, building them, testing them both in isolation and um, as a as an integrated service. So um, this means both running your unit tests, running a test designed for that specific service, running tests for multiple services at once. And um, if at any point the, of, the, uh, of this uh, coding pipeline, we find any errors or something, it, uh, the continuous integration system will collect information about the error for us and will expose it to us so that we can take action before the uh, the faulty code reaches production. So uh, continuous integration system has three main chores. First off, it allows you to merge code often. It allows you to um, test everything that is um, services with dependencies in near real time. And it allows you to find errors and failures faster and more reliably. Since everything is automated, it takes care of the heavy lifting for you and just hands you a nifty report of whether everything went well or not. And if so, what was the error? So you can actually track it down and fix it. In microservices, especially when we're starting to deal with a lot of, uh, of microservices, having a CI server is a must. You can no longer just uh, run it with a couple of bash commands and so on. You need something automated. Complexity can get pretty nasty pretty fast. And so if we can delegate this complexity to the computer and relieve ourselves from, from the mess, we can actually remain efficient. Speaking of tests, now, um, when we're dealing with tests, um, especially when we're dealing with tests in microservices, we want to minimize the amount of manual effort we'll, we're uh, performing. We don't want to, um, to be running manual tests. In my, in my in trying to verify everything works when you have a service mesh of 50 plus um, microservices or 100 plus microservices, it will, uh, it is not only inefficient, it is also extremely error prone. So um, managing complexity through automation is key for success when dealing with microservices. So, when we design tests, unlike what we might face uh, with a monolithic system in which we can use unit tests for pretty much everything, microservices actually have a little more, um, well, they demand a little bit more attention to the kind of tests we perform and how we perform them. So, um, has anyone ever heard about the uh, 
test hierarchy pyramid or the testing pyramid? Or is anyone familiar with the diagram shown here? Yeah, basically what it says is um, when it comes to testing, you want your testing strategy to be heavily focused on a small scale, for example, the unit test. And there's other types of tests like integrated test and UI test that are still being, should still be implemented, but uh, the majority should be on the unit basis. Yeah, you actually, you actually got it pretty close to the entire definition. So um, this diagram, um, the test hierarchy pyramid actually tells us a couple of things. First off, as Eric mentioned, the bulk of our tests is going to consist mainly of unit tests. We want to be testing each um, code component independently to make sure we are building the right thing. But um, since, since uh, all our code elements do not exist in the backend, we need to eventually test them together. That's what uh, component tests actually do. You grab a series of items, a series of um, classes or functions or whatever, and run, and run them one after the other, one after the other in the sequence that you're meant to be run. And you observe uh, how does your does this component chain behaves. Now, you also want to focus on doing component tests, but you won't be needing as many component tests as you need unit tests. Component tests, we could refer to them as sanity checks for your unit tests. So if your unit tests are, all, are already validating the, uh, the individual components, component tests should verify that the end-to-end -end flow between uh, one class method and the response in another, in another place behaves as, in, uh, behaves as intended. You no longer care about the about the uh, inner workings of it. You just want to know if, I, um, for example, if I send four, I get out a string. If I send one, I get out something else. If I send um, uh, an order request, I should get a, an inventory booking plus a, an invoice generator plus a lot of other things. Now, the difference between, uh, com between component and integration is that we are, we are not testing the entire service yet. When we are doing integration tests, we are verifying this, the entire service end to end. So if the service receives something, uh, for example, if, we, if, if the service receives an um, HTTP message to uh, to process an order or something, we should start seeing the service emit, for example, uh, an order process event, an invoice generated event, or whatever. And we should be able to observe those events independent, independent to how it is implemented. So we can think of integration tests as, yet again, a sanity, test, a sanity check for our independent components. If the entire chain of, uh, of events happening within the service is robust, our integration tests should work. And this also means that we shouldn't be doing as many integration tests as, as we do component tests. Because if we're making component tests correctly, uh, this should minimize the, the need for integration tests. At the end, we have end-to-end -end tests. End-to-end -end tests can be either um, a subset of your entire service mesh or the entire service mesh. The only requisite here is for you to be testing services interacting with each other. 
you are no longer concerned about what each specific uh, service is doing. You are only concerned in having entire pipelines or entire chains of events happening within your service. The classic end-to-end -end example is um, using the using your service, your application's UX to, uh, to trigger something and watching the response go all the way through your service mesh back to your client as a response. That's, that's a kind of end-to-end -end test. You're no longer interested in how it is implemented in the back. You just want to know that given some input from the user, you're getting some, some kind of response. Given some kind of event, um, the, ex the, service, the, the services that should react to that event are reacting in the, in the way that you're expecting them to react. So, so far, any errors? Do you want to, uh, sorry, any questions? No questions so far. So, let's jump then right to our last topic related to um to the to microservices and in this case we will be talking about deployments deployments just as with our tests and with our builds we want it to be automated because we um the more microservices we have the more complex it is for us to actually go ahead and Set up the set up the servers that will be running that uh, that service or whatever, installing the service, configuring it, making sure everything works, and so on. And well, if configuring one service is tedious enough, imagine you doing it manually for fifty now, or two hundred or one thousand. It can get pretty crazy. It can get pretty nasty. So. Automation, automation, automation. That's the key. Good thing is we have a lot of pretty cool uh, tools at our disposal to um, allow us to automate these kind of uh, behaviors in a way that it becomes pretty much transparent to the developers the way it works. The only, um, the only thing developers can then uh, focus on is um, just writing their code and ensuring the code they're sending is what they should be coding um, with the specifications requested and so on. And we can just let the entire, the entire machine build it, test it for us, integrate it, and deploy it uh, into whatever environment we see fit. So for deployment, we met, we generally use something called a continuous delivery service, or you can sometimes find it as continuous deployment. In practice, the difference between continuous integration and continuous deployment or continuous delivery is the usage. Pretty much every server that features uh, continuous integration can be retrofitted to actually perform deployments. So um, at the end of the day, it's just a matter of usage, not a matter of the tool. And well, now back, back to the idea of, immu of immutable stuff. So as we mentioned before, having mutable things uh, going around isn't generally the best way to, uh, to deal with to deal with uh, microservices. Since they are already inherently chaotic, we want to minimize the amount of um, the amount of configuration, the amount of uh, of changes, the amount of complexity in, uh, the service can actually bring to the table. So, as we did with our uh, shared models within the uh, the service mesh, 
we also have the concept of an immutable deployment. Now, please, without reading uh, without reading the definition I posted here, can anyone tell me what an immutable deployment is or what ideas does it bring to mind? Anyone? Sorry, I didn't hear the last part. Okay, so without reading the definition, what comes to mind when I mentioned the, the term immutable deployment? Oh, wow. That's... That it cannot change. Yeah. yeah. But deployment. Yep. I must, since you have their Docker and Kubernetes, I'm assuming that you set up the configuration and once it's configured and it has access to the data sources that it needs, then uh, the image, you should create like an image that cannot be modified, but it can be uh, multiplied or deployed multiple times, right? You have some part of the idea over there, but immutable deployment is not about the tool. So um, in this case, is it I, a, oh yeah, go ahead. Do you mean that you don't, you're opposed to versioning APIs and instead creating new deployments? Yeah, exactly. So um, if we go back to when we discussed versioning of uh, shared models, how could we introduce changes um, into a shared model? We copy it, modify it, and publish the copy. Am I right? Does something similar happens when we're talking about immutable deployments? We create a separate deployment with the new characteristics, the new configuration, the new uh, services or whatever, the new or updated services or whatever, and we progressively or concurrently phase out the old deployment. Once the new deployment is out there and everyone is using that one, we take down the old deployment. That's what immutable deployment means. It means once generated, we do not change it. If we want to update our deployment, we create an entire new deployment and ship that instead. Does that make any sense? Yes. Awesome. So now, what does immutable deployment have to do with, for example, in here I have Docker or, uh, or Kubernetes or whatever? As I mentioned, it is, these are tools we can use to implement immutable deployments but they by themselves do not provide immutable deployments. We can pretty much go ahead and make changes on the go with either of those tools and be doing your regular deployments and in the meantime, breaking everything in production or whatever. So um, the, main, the main focus here is since we are not talking about the tool itself as a means to um, achieve it out of the box, we can then therefore understand immutable deployments as more of a practice, uh, as more of a way to do it more than uh, something that we can find prepackaged. Now, Using tools like Docker for containers or virtual servers like um, AWS A, um, server images or um, Kubernetes uh, for orchestration. These tools allow us to help us deploy multiple servers at, a, at one single time. 
for example, we can use Kubernetes, we can use Docker to prepackage all of our um, independent services along with older dependencies. By the way, if you're never if you've never uh, heard about Docker or tried it or used it or whatever, I absolutely invite you to take a look and actually use it. Once you understand the concept of containers, it is actually a pretty, pretty cool tool, which can actually save a lot of time and effort in, build, in building and deploying your applications. So uh, back to the discussion. So we can prepackage our, our services using Docker. And afterwards, we can use Kubernetes to instruct our servers to deploy our services depending on any criteria we wish to. For example, um, if we have servers with uh, fast processors, we can we can schedule um, Kubernetes to deploy all um, time sensitive services in that particular location. Or if we have um, servers with a lot of memory, we can store databases in there. It actually gives us a lot of flexibility. But the most important thing about all of these tools is that they allow us to treat development, well, sorry, to treat deployment as just another piece of code. What advantage does it bring? That uh, the fact that we can treat deployments as code? Well, suddenly we are able to version control our deployments. We are suddenly able to modify them on the fly. We are able to scale them up to infinity if needed. So it opens up a brand new world of possibilities related to how we package and deliver our end product. It also allows us to reduce the friction between, um, between our local environments and the way our upper environments like um, some internal testing or production even, they, they can allow us to reduce the friction between these environments so that, develop, so that our local machine matches production as closely as possible. And this is actually something, if I may call it rebel, revolutionary, I would. This actually changes the game because we are no long, we are um, now no longer able to um, well, we are now able to observe in our local machines how does the entire thing work without actually needing to wait until it passes through all the statements through all the stages of uh, of building, testing, deploying, and so on, just to see the results. Our our work time, well, our our development and our understanding of the system can actually be enhanced by having um, environments mimicking each other. So. Now to um, finally bridge the gap between um, these, between the, the tools for the job and the concept of immutable deployments. When we, want, um, when we want to do immutable deployments, we have a couple of choices. If you're familiar with terms such as canary deployments or red blue deployments or um, Or, or similar uh, sim or or similar concepts, then you might you might be um, well. Let me rephrase that. If you've ever heard terms like canary releases or uh, red blue deployments, these are actually strategies to implement immutable deployments. What these do is something similar to what we saw on the. Uh, on the versioning side of uh, of share of the share models, these are strategies. For example, 
if we were to perform deployments by means of uh, of of a blue green deployment, we will be having two separate instances of our target environment with one receiving all the uh, production traffic, the other one receiving none of it. We deploy onto the one that is receiving nothing. And little by little, we start moving some of the traffic from the, uh, the, current, the currently active server to our recently deployed service. As we observe it and, and, and measure its stability and, and as time goes on and users are using it and nothing breaks down or nothing bad happens, we can start redirecting more and more traffic until suddenly our new deployment has all the traffic and the other deployment has none of it. Then we just change sites. We deploy onto the one that has nothing. We start uh, redirecting traffic little by little, and then we switch. If for any reason the new deployment has an issue, we can simply redirect all this uh, all this traffic back to the original instance, fix it, patch it, submit a new one, and repeat. So that's one way to achieve immutable deployments. Another, pop another popular way is through canary releases in which the, in which the users of the uh, production application actually subscribe to receiving, uh, to, you, to accessing these new deployments faster on the knowledge that they may have issues. So that way you are actually using some of the production traffic to test your application while um, you prepare for it to take the place of the old deployment. And again, once you verify everything is working over here, you can just switch. Uh, you can just switch. What is the difference here? The difference is that um, the canary release the use the the users of the canary release actually use it with the knowledge that it may contain issues it may contain bugs and that you are actually watching it to understand if everything is proceeding as expected so it's like you get all these new features but there may be bugs that kind of situation it's actually pretty common with other software packages. For example, um, with a Chrome browser, you can actually get a canary release to test features before they are launched into uh, for the general public by going yourself and, and downloading that specific version. So. At least for deployment, I think that's all on our all in that. So um, we still have a little time, so um, we can actually walk through through the case study I had prepared over here and um, comment about it. So let me select. Okay, so this case study, um, it does, uh, we are actually not able to see who, uh, which company implemented it, but it does contain a couple observations that we might be, um, that we might correlate with what we just saw over here or whatever else. So, um, Let's look at let's look at the uh, at the case itself um, little by little and comment on it, and we might actually discuss on based on what we've seen or our understanding how could uh, how could we have done it in a different way. 
So in here, um, they explain what is their concept of microservices. In here, we can see like their kind of definition for a microservice. In, they actually went for um, defining a microservice as a single activity. So they have one service to, uh, to act as a file watcher. They have another one to, um, to act as a simple gateway, another one for aggregation, another one for a message queue, that kind of stuff. So this is actually one way to go about doing microservices. If your application is complex though, it might not be the, the best way to do it. Why? Because the more activities our service is performing, the more services we might have. And we usually want to strike a balance between how many services do we have versus how many, well, we usually want to keep our service count at the bare minimum because as we mentioned before, scaling things up can actually make, make certain complexity issues or in short works issues. Um, become not only more visible, but bigger. So um, if we if these were like a new application or something, having 85 plus microservices right out of the bat will be uh, pretty much unmanageable. In the case of this particular um, of this particular company, since they already had the uh, the departments in place and so on. And they were already pretty much in the culture of um, managing their own uh, service area. This transition, this transition can be managed. But if, we are the, if, if the team were new or if their experience was dealing with a single, a single large monolith, trying to go fully in on microservices and starting generating these much microservices could actually backfire on them uh, pretty badly. So um, in this case, I would say this particular company managed their, their migration to microservices in a pretty organized fashion. So checks for them. I would have chosen a different way to structure instead of having them doing one activity, I would have them be like one business area or something like that in order for us to reduce the amount of microservices to something more aligned to our, to our actual structure. So there, in order for us to reduce friction and to help our internal team dynamics. That is something we actually went into detail on the uh, on the first workshop, but I will you know, just briefly mention it over here. In general, when dealing with uh, when implementing microservices within uh, within some sort of organization, the microserv the 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 best way to go about it is to try to stick to your um, or to your act to the structure of your actual organization the clo the as closely as you can that way you reduce the need for uh, for 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 example some team having to go to ask another one because some of its some of its components actually um, they do not understand because that's not their area of expertise and they need to go over there. So um, you like allow knowledge to become focused on one hand and shared on the other because now you're forcing these uh, separate departments to communicate with each other. So it actually fits better with most organization structures to keep everything aligned with uh, business areas. It is not always the case, but 
the, the usual advice is to try and stick with these kind of definitions so that you can have um, the, the knowledge required for the application available at the site that it will be most needed. Then they mentioned, they mentioned about security. In this case, um, these companies actually pretty um, Microsoft centric. So they are actually using Active Directory. They are using uh, .NET solutions and whatnot. But um, the principles here are actually pretty solid and we can share it across different areas. We didn't go into security in our presentation because, well, um, security is a whole different beast, which would require several sessions to actually be able to understand. Security is not simple. So in this case, what they did was they had each service have its own its own set of credentials to authenticate everything they did. This is actually pretty sound advice in general terms. Maybe application frameworks. Okay. Now we jump into how into how to structure our code. In here, um, in the in the case study, they are, they are actually mentioning that they created this sort of application frame, uh, application framework to be able to um, reuse as much uh, common code as possible. This, is act this actually goes in hand with, for example, what we mentioned on the shared models. Shared models actually can belong to this kind of, uh, to this kind of, uh, Frame of general framework. In general, there are some elements of code and some elements of um, utilities and so on that will be shared throughout different locations. So even though the rules of, um, of for example, the, the right principle or the keys principle are not fully respected when dealing with microservices, some of the most common areas like configuration or logging or something like that, those are actually best when we have, when we keep them shared across different services. So having an application framework for microservices actually helps you reduce the friction. And okay, I think it's seven oh six. So um, seven so um, I guess we can cut it over here because of time. I'm seeing uh several have already left. Maybe because it's already too late. So um, I think I'll be stopping from uh, at this point. So um, any last questions before we close? Okay, I see there's uh, no questions so far, um, but actually you mentioned the security part. That's a very interesting aspect that maybe we can revisit in the future. But um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, it has been amazing uh, and very detailed. And um, we, in our next session, we're gonna have um, UI UX uh, Figma, uh, an introduction to UI UX design using Figma. But uh, thank you, Liz, once more. And um, it was, yeah, Valerie saying, very informative. In thank you, Valerie. Okay, well, thank
thanks everyone for attending our presentation today. Thank you, Luis, and have a, have a great evening. Thank, thank you for the invitation.